Joining me now is Bob Nightingale of USA Today to talk all things hot stove, and we certainly have no shortage of headlines. I want to start with the biggest news, I guess, of this offseason, certainly around where I live in New York and probably all around the country, and that's Aaron Judge. How were the Yankees ultimately able to get this deal done? Which is pretty much Hal Starber saying, well, no matter what the cost, we need to bring this guy back. He means everything to us. You know, they'll name him captain. Probably in his press coverage, I would imagine. Uh, but just, you know, as great as a player he is, he's even a nicer person to face that franchise. Uh, no matter who they try to replace him with, it wasn't going to be Aaron Judge. So I think it was just a matter of, what, you know, whatever it takes. And, you know, when the Giants, you know, went up to nine years at 360, the Padres even went up to 10 years at 400. Aaron Judge didn't want to leave the Yankees. They certainly wanted to bring him back. There are fewer more iconic uniforms in sports than pinstripes. Obviously, it's been well documented the value that he brings to the Yankees franchise. Like you said, such a nice guy, such a personable guy, and really handled things the right way in terms of betting on himself. Uh, but for Aaron Judge, on the contrary, outside of the money, you know, to be tied to such an iconic storied franchise for so long, is this a deal that really made sense for both sides? It does. But I think if the Yankees are realistic, you know, they'll, they'll want to say, you want to even know if you'll have a, a season like that again. Uh, you know, we don't know how many great seasons will be among the nine years, but it's worth the investment. And, you know, I mean, it's a star power. He sells tickets. He sells merchandise. TV ratings are up when they're on. So I just think when you throw all those ingredients in there and said, you know, no matter what the price was, it, it's going to be worth it. What sense do you have, Bob, of, of how serious it could have gotten with San Francisco? Obviously, it doesn't matter now, but even though Aaron Judge seemed to say all the right things and do all the right things, there was a little bit of murmuring, some speculation that he might have been frustrated at times with, with the Yankees, particularly over the last couple of months heading into the postseason. Do you think the, that San Francisco was at one point a realistic possibility? I do. There was a growing sense of optimism by giant officials uh, Monday and Tuesday, uh, they, they were getting good vibes from uh, Aaron Judge in the camp. And I think they knew, too, that they would have had a blow with the Yankees out of the water. You know, I mean, Xander Bogart's going to go back to Boston, but when the Padres offered him $120 million more, it kind of leaves you no choice. I think the Giants would have had to do something real crazy, too, just to get uh, Judge there. I, I think it would have had to be a colossal amount of money to leave on the table for him to choose the Giants or the Yankees. And to your earlier point, Bob, fewer sources of motivation are bigger than when your future's on the line. And everybody really gave him so much respect and kudos for betting on himself. He turned in a heck of a season. What What is realistic now for Yankees fans to expect next season and the season after that? Well, yeah, we'll see. I mean, they got to build around him. I mean, he was there last year and you know, they got bounced, uh, you know, swept by the Houston Astros. Uh, in the ALCS. So, you know, they're going to need some more pitching. They're going to need an outfielder like an Andrew Benatendi, uh, you know, maybe better luck health-wise. Uh, you know, we'll see about the bullpen now with Chapman gone. Uh, so, yeah, they're going to need some more help besides just getting judged, and I think it's going to take more payroll. I mean, I think they're going to have to go over the luxury tax to get the kind of team they want. You've, you've been covering sports a long time, obviously been covering baseball for a very long time. Is this one of the better bet on yourself stories that you can recall in terms of taking a, a decent amount of risk and, and going through last season? It certainly is. I mean, money wise, it's got to be, you know, when you're talking going from two thirteen and a half million dollars to three sixty. you know, that's a $147 million push right there. So that, you know, that part's got to be a record. You know, Alexander Bogart's been himself, too. The uh, Boston Red Sox offered him extension, which would have made a uh, you know, three-year deal for $90 million. You know, he turned out to 280 So he, he did quite well himself by, uh, by gambling on himself. But, yeah, it was a, uh, a lot of pressure. You know, Max Scherzer did that years ago. The Detroit Tigers turned on a big contract, got about $80, $90 million more with the uh, Washington Nationals. So I, I think teams like it, too, with a guy that's willing to bet himself. It shows that he's going to be very, very motivated. And usually those people have monster years, which Aaron Judge did. What, what does that deal, what does that Xander Bogart deal say about the Padres? That they don't care about losing money. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I mean, they were offered Judge $400 million. They offered Trey Turner 
342. Uh, you know, their owner is uh, the nephew of uh, Peter O'Malley, you know, the former Dodger owner. And, you know, I mean, he's a wealthy man, he's a billionaire, but so are a lot of other owners. Uh, you yeah, know, they don't have a big market, 27th largest market in the country, but he does not care about losing money. He just wants to have a World Series to leave that as his legacy. And, I've, you know, of course, the Padres never won one. Just going back to New York for a minute, how should both Mets and Yankees fans ultimately feel about what happened last season in the postseason? I mean, being around here, living in New York, we, we were really saying at one point, whether it's naive or silly or not, or many fans just wanted to wish it, that the World Series is going to be a subway series. And yet we saw them fall woefully short in the postseason. I mean, what what should New York baseball fans think about the way that the Yankees and Mets ultimately performed in the postseason? Well, I think for the Mets fans, there's a little let down at the end just because they didn't beat out Atlanta for the division. It's like, uh-oh, you know, now a wild card team. So I think they kind of brace themselves like, okay, you know, they brace themselves not to go to the World Series. And they, uh, and so it was still a great year. Now I think they have the same expectations as the Yankees. You know, for the Yankees, of course, it's different. Anything shy of a World Series championship is a disappointment. I think they both share that same goal this year and the same expectations some of the fan base does. So here comes Justin Verlander, Bob, for the Mets, two years just shy of $90 million, and they saw DeGrom leave. Is is Verlander a, a decent trade-off for, for Jacob DeGrom? I mean, how do you view the Mets adding Verlander? You know, I think it's a, uh, a great move by the Mets. I mean, with DeGrom, obviously when he's healthy, he's the best pitch on the planet. He just hasn't been healthy. Uh, Justin Berlin already went through his time in job surgery. I mean, here he is at 39 years old, you know, went 18 and four with a 1.75 ERA. Uh, unbelievable uh, starting pitcher still at his age. So it's kind of cool to see him and Scherzer back together, uh, you know, for the Detroit Tiger days. And uh, obviously, you know, Berliner, you know, I'm not sure if he'll ever have that kind of season again like he did last year, but he's a gutsy guy. He's fouling the National League. And he used to always say, you know, put me in with some of the uh, greats like Kershaw and stuff, because those guys in the National League, which usually were weaker league as far as a, uh, you know, lineups, you know, particularly the DH. And now uh, I think he'll really enjoy himself in New York. I think he'll have a phenomenal year or two. It's a really fun club to follow. Buck Showalter is just uh, such a fun character to to play manager, I guess, with that group of guys. And you note all the talent that is there already. But what do you think they need to add? Where else can they add um, to get even better for, for next season? Well, you know, it was, it was great getting Brandon Nemo back for what he does. Uh, they need another starting pitcher. You can always use more help in the bullpen. So uh, I think they'll sniff around. I mean, they already have a huge payroll right now. I think with the luxury tax, it's going to be a record over $330 million. So I think more of the spare type parts instead of some big, uh, instead of some big piece. Uh, I'd be surprised if they went and got another big time starter just because, well, one, they don't really need one, but just at, at some point they got to say enough's enough money-wise. Do you, do the Yankees need, I mean, obviously not another big piece as much as Aaron Judge, but what what is going to really kind of fortify them? Yeah, they could use, certainly use some more pitching for sure. I mean, I know, you know they're in the uh, Rondon uh, sweepstakes. I'm not sure if they'll go to seven years like they want. Uh, but, you know, Carlos Rondon had a very good season, you know, last year for the San Francisco Giants. Now, he's been injury prone too, so I think your team's a little skittish on that. I'm sure the Yankees are. But no matter what, they need some more pitching. And as Brian Cashman said at the winter meetings, they'd love to get Andrew Benatini back. They need somebody out there to play left field. It seemed like, Bob, fans were Yankees fans were kind of going back and forth, vacillating between, oh, the problem is we don't have enough pitching, and, oh, the problem is we don't know how to play small ball. We've got all these home run hitters, but when they go cold or when Giancarlo Stanton's not around, all of a sudden we have problems offensively. What do you think it was? Was it, was it pitching that plagued them the most, or do they need to try to make some offensive adjustments so that they can be a little bit more versatile and multidimensional? A little bit of both. I mean, a, uh, it was a thin rotation, uh, you know, going into the postseason. And then, yeah, you look at the Houston Astros. They play small ball. They put that ball in play. And the Yankees' drought, you know, really hit them. I mean, you're absolutely right. It's either, you know, feast or famine with the home runs and strikeouts. 
uh, you know, I think they're hoping for, you know, better play from, uh, you know, third base like with Josh Donaldson. Hopefully Aaron Hicks can uh, bounce back. But, yeah, that, but that's the way they're built. They're built by uh, for the home run ball, and uh, they're going to live or die by that. And, you know, hopefully for their sake, when come postseason time once again, you know, that those guys are hot at the right time. In today's MLB, is it better to be built to be a, a team that has a lot of offensive firepower that's a home run hitting club, or is it better to be built – uh, for a team that can manufacture runs when they need to? I think better, you know, manufacture runs. Certainly you, you got to have a great pitching staff. You're not going to win without a great pitching staff. But you look at a team like the uh, Houston Astros, they did both. They played small ball and they had the big home run hitters. So that's what you love to have, it's just a, a combination there. I don't think you can win one way or the other. You got to have a mixture. I mean, look at the Cleveland Guardians, great pitching staff. They put the ball in play as well as anybody without those home run thumpers and ended up costing them in the playoffs. You mentioned DeGrom's health and availability, Bob. How concerned should Texas be with the number of starts that he was able to make last year? I mean, like you said, when he's healthy, he's the best in the business, but we haven't seen that be the case. No, that took a gamble. I don't think anybody thought that he was going to get a five-year contract. You know, look like more of a three-year type contract, you know, a four-year maximum. And here's another guy that, you know, better himself by, by opting out. So we'll see. Uh, I'm sure they're hoping, you know, the, the worst is behind them. Uh, they got a safeguard here, protect that arm. So, you know, they said for five years, I think realistic, they're hoping for a good, say, three and a half years. Uh, I'm not sure if, if they really believe we're going to get 35 starts a year, you know, objective to ground for five straight years. What landing spots do you see for Carlos Correa and what, how much cash do you think he could potentially land in a deal? I mean, would it exceed that of what we just saw with Sandra Bogarts? I mean, Bogarts' contract was stunning. That was the most stunning contract we've seen this winter so far. I don't think anybody thought he'd get $280 million. I mean, the Red Sox offered 160 in comparison. So if he's getting 280 million, Correa is definitely getting over 310 320 uh, the national landing stop, stop has got to be San Francisco Giants. They already showed they got $360 million to spend. They need star power. Uh, as great as the franchise has been, attendance has been way down. Last year, they drew the fewest fans in their new ballpark since it was built, uh, you know, about 15 years ago. So I would think Correa would be the, the, the perfect spot there. I know the Cubs are in on them. I can't see the Cubs outspending the Giants. We've touched on the some of the bigger names. Uh, is are there other players that that I'm not thinking about that that general sports fans or baseball fans might not be thinking about who are players that could ultimately make a, a very big difference on a team? You know, you still got Senga, that you know the Japanese pitcher, uh, big time starter, so he will make a difference. And we haven't even touched a trade market yet. That's going to happen. Sean Murphy of Oakland, uh, you know, he should be dealt at some point. He's the big chip as, as a catcher. And then we'll see. I mean, then you start dealing with prospects and everything else uh, to see who's available. The Milwaukee Brewers said their two top starters are not available. Corbin Burns and Brandon Woodruff, uh, you know, maybe reach down to uh, get Lopez from uh, the Miami Marlins. Uh, we'll see. But, you know, the trade market really hasn't started. We'll start to see that develop here in probably the next week or two. Just generally, are you are you surprised to see so much money being tossed around by by these big name free agents? Is there anything about this particular off season that that has resonated for you that that has surprised you about how different the landscape might look next season, or or how much money these guys are fetching? Just remarkable what we've seen so far, and like you said, there's still so much more to come. Yeah, stunning. I mean, they've had uh, what over two billion dollars in this free agent market already. Uh, it's probably going to approach, you know, $3 billion by the time it's over. You know, Rob Manford said that they had uh, almost $11 billion of revenue. They just sold the rest of their uh, BAM technology, the streaming rights, for $900 million. So that's three hundred. That's a, uh, you know, $30 million per team. Uh, the money's, you know, the, the game is flush with money, and the owners are spending it. I mean, outside the Oakland A's, there is not one team that say, hey, we're cutting back, we're keeping the payroll the same. Everybody's talking about increasing payroll. So the game is in a healthy place, in your opinion? I mean, I know that's always the knock on baseball, right? What's America's pastime? But uh, the money, the numbers would seem to indicate that, that there's still a tremendous amount of interest in the sport. 
No, absolutely. It was a you know long season. Obviously, you don't get the TV ratings as a, as a NFL, not even close, not even an NBA. I mean, you know, I mean, baseball realizes how powerful the NBA. I mean, not the NFL is. Uh, you know, that's probably America's pastime, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, the sport is very, very healthy. And tell you what, with these new contracts that are being thrown out, you know, maybe some of these young kids now, these great athletes, will say, you know what, instead of NFL or NBA. Let me take a crack at uh, baseball. I mean, you know, a guy like LeBron James with us, with his athleticism, you figured he would have been a great, you know, power hitter. He probably would have been a Aaron Judge type player. But so many great athletes, you know, in the United States and the world today, you know, maybe baseball throwing out that kind of money will be a recruiting tool for these kids. That's a fascinating idea uh, and great insight w- with what's happening right now after these winter meetings. Bob Nightingale of USA Today, thanks so much for taking a couple minutes. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you. 